Welcome to this installment of our ongoing speaker series in the Hoover Institution's project on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific region, an initiative sponsored by the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office that promotes research, teaching, and public understanding about Taiwan and the critically important region it inhabits. I am Glenn Tifford, a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I manage the project under the leadership of my colleague, Larry Diamond. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. David Fell. Dr. Fell is a force in the field of Taiwan studies. He is reader in comparative politics at the Department of Politics and International Studies of the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London, and director of its world-renowned Center of Taiwan Studies. In 2004, he helped establish the European Association of Taiwan Studies. Dr. Fell is an expert on Taiwan's domestic politics and has published widely in that area. His first book, Party Politics in Taiwan, examined party change in the first 15 years of multi-party politics. His second book, Government and Politics in Taiwan, was recently revised in a second edition in 2018. He has also edited volumes on migration to and from Taiwan and on how the field of Taiwan studies has evolved. His current research focuses on Taiwan's movement parties, and that is what he will be discussing today. Before turning to Dr. Fell, I'd like to direct your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of your windows. When the question and answer portion of our program begins, you'll be asked to submit your questions by clicking on it. Without further delay, I present Dr. David Fell. Thanks very much, Glenn and uh, Larry. It's a pleasure to be back here in, uh, in Stanford and uh, talking about a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, last time I was here was back in uh, October 2015, and uh, uh, at that time I was giving a talk as part of a part of a Stanford conference on small parties in Taiwan's 2016 uh, elections. Uh, that went on to become a um, uh, a paper in the American Journal of Chinese Studies. Um, titled Small Parties in Taiwan's 2016 Elections, a limited um, breakthrough. So what I wanted to do today was to um, build on um, uh, that talk that I did um, uh, almost five years ago, but take a slightly more uh, narrow focus, um, a focus particularly on one type of small parties um, and how they've developed um, over the last um, decade or so. Now, the topic of, of movement parties in Taiwan um, raises, I think, a couple of really interesting uh, puzzles. Um, firstly, um, why do we see movement parties finally becoming serious players in Taiwan's party system after decades of being almost irrelevant actors in the, in the party uh, system? Um, and secondly, um, how do we explain the variation in movement party success over the, uh, the last decade or so. So in other words, um, a large number of movement parties have contested elections uh, in recent years, but some have been more successful than others. So how do we understand that uh, variation? Naturally, we need to um, um, say a few words on um, how we kind of define our kind of core concepts. So for the purpose of uh, this talk, um, um, I take movement parties as, as registered parties that originate from social movements, um, which tend to navigate a position on the boundaries between civil and political society. Uh, I think one of the things that we find when we look at this topic is how these are often quite blurred boundaries, and activists move quite naturally between civil and political uh, society. Um, a further kind of question that we need to think about is um, which movement parties to, to look at, because um, anyone who's been following Taiwan's recent elections will see that um, there's been a lot of diversity uh, in options that Taiwanese voters are given. Um, and so I'm going to, just going to focus on um, uh, a small number, a select number of um, movement parties and try and look at uh, how we understand um, their success and failure. So the cases that I will look at are the Green Party Taiwan, uh, the uh, New Power Party, they're the two ones where we have the, uh, the party badge. And I will also um, touch briefly on the Social Democratic Party, partly because of its alliance in 2016 with the 
uh, the Green Party, but also the state building uh, party, which uh, does uh, win a seat in Parliament in, in 2020. So these are our, um, our, our party cases. Now, one of the things that I often get challenged on um, when it comes to movement parties is why actually study them? Um, now, one of the reasons for this challenge is that um, Taiwan's party system has been dominated since the um, um, mid 1980s by two political parties, the Kuomintang and the Democratic Progressive Party, the DDP. Um, and, and this has been the case essentially since the first semi-democratic um, multi-party election in 1986. Um, and this means the Taiwan party system looks very, very different from most other uh, third wave democracies um, in the fact that it has had such a stable uh, party system. Um, just try, for example, comparing um, Taiwan's party system with that of Japan or South Korea. Uh, 25 or 30 years ago. Um, and what you'll find in those cases is a huge amount of change. Many of the actors that we saw in the Japanese or the Korean party system um, have either ceased to exist or have become irrelevant. Or, um, but that's not the case in, in Taiwan. So why uh, focus on movement parties in Taiwan? Well, I think that um, uh, often when people are um, are uh, looking at their justification for their research projects, often as a personal side. And I think for, uh, for me, I think it was the fact that my first elections in Taiwan, first as a student and then as a teacher in Taiwan, um, featured uh, a number of um, movement parties, particularly leftist, um, 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 social democratic parties. Um, and once we can see an example of this, this picture from a, uh, Workers' Party um, a candidate from, I think, from 1992. However, these leftist um, movement parties um, were failures. Um, now, a further reason that kind of got me interested in this topic of small parties in, in Taiwan was coming out of my first book that Glenn mentioned that came out of my PhD, Party Politics in, in Taiwan. And I looked at three, the three major political parties from the 1990s, the KMT, DUP, and the, the New Party. And the New Party um, was the first third party to enter Taiwan's party system. Um, and what I found really fascinating, particularly in the, um, the latter period um, of the analysis, in the late 1990s, was how the new party was taking very irrational um, strategies. So why would a party take um, 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 positions and use appeals that seem to um, um, be going against the political market? And that's that kind of led me to think about small parties. And I, and I started to publish on small parties um, in 2005. Now, we can think about the development of small parties in the Taiwanese party system as going through a number of the first phase I've mentioned, the failed, mainly leftist parties. We have, a period, we have two periods when splinter parties um, are quite successful. And what I mean by splinter parties are parties that split away from the two mainstream parties. Firstly, in the um, mid 1990s, and then in the period between 2000 and 2005. In the fourth phase, what we see is a virtual collapse of the small parties. Um, I think this, the, the classic example of this is 2008, when the small parties basically disappear from Taiwan's national parliament. We see a limited revival in uh, 2012, when the uh, splinter part, two of the splinter parties do return to parliament. Um, and then in the most recent phase, which I think we can date from around 2014, we see a gradual um, uh, disappearance or demise of the splinter parties um, and a rise of movement parties. So finally movement parties uh, become um, relevant actors in the Taiwanese party system. So just to simplify this, this uh, process, at least until 2014, 
it tended to be these purifier or splinter parties uh, that were uh, more successful. And that trend changes after uh, 2014. And most of today's talk will focus on the post-2014 uh, period. And we can kind of um, get a sense of these trends by this, uh, this table here. And, and to make it easier to follow, I've um, put the splinter parties in red and the um, uh, movement or alternative parties in blue. And you can see how um, the splinter parties are pretty successful um, in the mid 90s through until uh, 2005, while the movement parties are essentially um, uh, irrelevant. But that changes in the um, period after 2012, 2014, 2016, and most recently uh, 2020. Um, now, I think another reason that I have to uh, mention is that. Um, I've been working on a book project on Taiwan's Green Party uh, since late 2012. Um, and for me, it's been a really fascinating process uh, working with politicians and activists um, who have a very, very different uh, worldview compared to those mainstream party politicians that I spent um, 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 focusing on for my first book, Party Politics uh, in, in Taiwan. So this was um, a fascinating process um, uh, for me. So I will tend to talk a little bit more about the Green Party when I do the, uh, the case uh, analysis. And I think another reason why I wanted to do this, this talk was to give me a chance to think about the most recent elections in 2020, because I still haven't yet written the uh, chapter that covers 20. Uh, 20. So I'm looking forward to getting some feedback um, whether I've got my analysis right for um, uh, for 2020. Um, now I think there's also a number of um, uh, academic reasons why I think this topic is really interesting and important. Um, generally uh, movement parties play an important role in representing both issues and also sectors of society that tend to get neglected by mainstream Party. So I would argue that, that movement parties do have an important role in enriching the quality um, of democracy. And I think one of the things that we found in the Taiwan case was that um, the huge wave of social movements that we saw in the aftermath of 2008, um, uh, that we tend to associate with the, um, uh, the particularly with the sunflower movement, um, was partly caused by a uh, perceived failure uh, of mainstream parties. There was a lot of alienation in society and distrust of mainstream uh, parties. And I think one of the things that we, we see is that these movement parties have played a really important role in putting neglected issues onto the political agenda. For example, uh, LGBT uh, rights environmental protection, labor rights, animal welfare. These are all things that um, have really come onto the agenda in the last few years. And I think movement parties have played a really important role um, in that uh, process. We can also see the way that movement parties um, have been quite influential um, on some of the mainstream parties, particularly the, uh, the DVP. So for example, uh, we, we've seen the way that the DVP has um, um, adopted policies such as same-sex marriage. And I think one of the reasons has been this threat coming from um, these smaller alternative parties. Another way we can see the, um, the threat that these parties pose to mainstream parties um, is in the way that they often will try to poach um, politicians or leaders from movement parties. Um, and one such example is uh, Banyu, who we see in the slide uh, here, who had been the key figure in the Social Democratic uh, Party, but was recruited into uh, the DVP in 2020. And we, I think we also see this in terms of social movement leaders, such as Lin Fei, for example, is another case that was also recruited um, into the, um, uh, the DVP. So this, although this, this kind of poaching can 
um, undermine movement parties. It also can change the nature of the mainstream party, particularly the, uh, the DVP. So there's a number of, of ways that political science has tried to explain the um, fortunes of, of small parties. I think we can think about a number of kind of classic theoretical uh, approaches. Uh, a first one is what is sometimes called the sociological approach. Um, and that tries to link uh, niche party success to the saliency um, of um, core issues. Um, for example, Green Party success is often linked to uh, levels of environmental consciousness. Um, the uh, support of far-right parties is often linked to uh, things such as levels of immigration or unemployment, for example. Um, another uh, classic approach is institutional. And here the, um, uh, the key focus is on electoral systems. So simply put, um, it's argued that there's greater space for small parties in more proportional uh, electoral uh, systems. Uh, and much less space in uh, single member district or first past the post uh, based uh, electoral systems. Um, how useful are these approaches for the, uh, the Taiwan case? Um, well, they can help a little bit, but they can't tell us the whole story. Um, for example, um, if we think about the sociological approach, um, changes in um, social values such as environmental consciousness, uh, growing um, acceptance of LGBT rights have created space uh, for alternative parties. But that can't tell us what, um, why we see variation in small party fortunes, why certain small parties are more um, uh, successful. Similarly, the electoral system is important as we saw in the collapse of small parties after the introdu introduction of a single member district dominated electoral system after 2005. However, um, one of the things that we see after um, uh, 2012 is that movement parties actually become competitive uh, despite the very hostile uh, electoral system. So again, uh, these uh, approaches can only tell us part of the story. Um, now for my study, I've, um, um, I've been quite heavily influenced by the work of J.J. Spoon um, and uh, Bonnie Megwood. Um, Megwood particularly focuses on the role of mainstream party strategies uh, in affecting small party um, at success or failure, while Spoon uh, looks more at small party uh, agency. So what I've tried to do is to create a framework of analysis uh, the builds on Megwood and Spoon's work to try and understand um, uh, the fortunes of movement parties um, in um, recent Taiwanese elections. So, for example, looking at uh, the impact of more um, dismissive or adversarial mainstream party approaches on small parties. But one way I've tried to build on Megwood is to bring in um, the variable of competing small parties. Um, one simple way we can kind of uh, think about this um, is that uh, in the last election in 2012, there were 19 separate parties competing for the, the party list. With more parties and um, a more competitive small party uh, market, it's much harder to get over that um, critical 5% that parties need to get into parliament. But in addition, um, I've brought in um, Megwid's small party agency approach. In other words, what Megwid argues, sorry, what Spoon argues is that the key to small party survival is getting a balance between vote maximizing and uh, their own core policy preferences and values. Um, if they get out of balance, for example, neglecting um, vote maximizing, uh, then they will have a uh, problem. So it's a balancing act. And I think one of the things that really comes out of um, uh, the Green Party book is that small party agency really matters. And I think with better electoral strategies, the Green Party could have been much more uh, successful despite uh, the often hostile political environment that it was operating in. 
okay, um, uh, I've done what I often tell my students not to do and spend too long talking about the, uh, the groundwork. Let me talk now about um, the case studies of 2016 and uh, 2020 and try and apply this uh, framework. So 2016, I think, is really fascinating because um, um, it's the new power party, a brand new party that's less than a year old enters parliament in 2016 and becomes the third largest party. But it's not the older, more experienced um, Green Party. And many had expected the Green Party to make its national breakthrough in uh, 2016, particularly as it had done quite well in 2012 and had won local seats in uh, 2014. So how do we explain uh, this, um, this pattern? Okay, let me first then look at the, um, the party system and how that can help us understand um, the New Power Party success. Well, a key element of the New Power Party success in 2016 was its alliance with the mainstream DDP. The DDP gave it uh, three districts to compete against the, um, uh, the KMT, all of which uh, they won. And the DDP and Taiwan, as we see in this picture, uh, did back New Power Party candidates in the districts. Um, but of course, there were um, small parties, there are dangers of working with mainstream parties. And we did see this in the 2016 campaign when the DP tried to uh, make social movement appeals, particularly in the last couple of weeks of the campaign. And finally, this meant that the New Power Party only just crossed that critical 5%. But we also need to consider the competing small parties in understanding the new power party's success. Clearly, the party benefited from a declining Taiwan Solidarity Union and from competing against the divided and slightly disorganized uh, Green Party. Okay, but I think we need to recognize that the new power party's success in 2016 was also closely related to a very, very successful uh, campaign. It got the balance right between vote maximizing and uh, party values. For example, it ran a very well resourced campaign in terms of human resources and also financial resources. It focused its resources very um, uh, clearly on those three key target uh, districts. Of course, none of those were safe um, DVP districts. So it did need to run campaigns. It also had very effective. Um, internet and political communications campaign, very um, powerful rallies, and it got a lot more media attention than the uh, competing small parties. It also was very successful at either stealing or contesting issue ownership, both from the um, Taiwan Solidarity Union and the Green uh, Party. And if we see this um, uh, image that comes from one of the New Power Party's ads, um, we can see things like uh, nuclear-free nuclear homeland, anti-pollution, food safety. Um, these are all things that had been traditionally uh, Green Party appeals. Um, Same-sex marriage also appears in this, uh, in this ad. But um, this meant that the New Power Party had both mainstream and also alternative appeals. So I called it a hybrid party um, in 2016. Okay, next, what about the Green Party? What was wrong with um, uh, their uh, election campaign. Well, firstly, um, the party suffered from DPs. The DPs uh, movement appeals did hit the um, uh, Green Party, Social Democratic Party alliance. We can see that in uh, this uh, ad here. Um, it also didn't offer the Green Party uh, any seats to contest against the, um, the KMT, with the exception of the Social Democratic Party fan unions, one seat, uh, sorry, one district. But it also poached um, uh, figures from the Green Party. And we can see, see that in this ad here, where we have two former uh, Green Party leaders nominated by the, um, uh, the DVP, and also um, two former um, party candidates or party uh, members. Um, and then finally, um, the Green Party suffered from competing small parties, particularly the challenges 
of the new power party, uh, so a um, competitive rival movement party, and the Green Party itself was also damaged by its own internal split with the creation of the Trees Party. Okay, so the party system definitely undermined the Green Party in 2016, but um, a, a lot of the problems for the Green Party in 2016 can be put down to problems in the campaign. Uh, so for example, um, it was unwilling or unable to work with other parties such as the New Power Party or the DDP. Probably if it had had a better strategy, it could have um, had uh, a couple of districts to contest directly against the KMT. Uh, secondly, even though it was working in alliance with the SDP, it had a very, very poor relationship. Um, and much of the party's efforts were wasted in infighting between the, uh, the two sides, particularly over uh, Fanyun's district. The party also had strategic problems in neglecting the single member districts and just focusing solely on the uh, party list. Uh, the party was also um, uh, suffered from infighting and uh, divisions. Um, although it was better resourced than in 2012, uh, it was still far behind both the splinter parties and the new power party. Um, and lastly, it had very serious problems in terms of the way that its uh, organization was uh, working. So for example, it really struggled to um, uh, cope with the uh, Zhou Zhuyu uh, incident just before the uh, election. Okay, so let me move on to my second election case study, and that's the most recent national elections in January of 2020. So here the picture is a little bit different. Um, this time we have two mo movement parties winning seats, the new power party and also the, uh, the brand new um, or the um, uh, state building party. Um, what is interesting here is that um, the new power party manages to survive a number of crises. It has but still stays in parliament and even actually increases its vote share uh, to almost uh, 8%. The, the second movement party that enters parliament in 2020 is the state building party. Um, and this is actually not a brand new party because it had contested um, 2014 when it was still independent, 2016 with the TSU and 2018 uh, in local elections. Um, so it's learned from some of its previous failures and managed to win one seat in 2020 uh, and also get 3.1% uh, on the uh, party list. In contrast, the Green Party um, got almost exactly the same uh, vote share as 2016. Uh, it won more votes, but, was, but again was only halfway uh, to reaching that uh, critical 5% to win party list, party list seats. Okay, so how do we explain uh, the patterns that we see um, in 2020? Let me start with the New Power Party. Um, well, firstly, the party system mattered. Uh, the New Power Party broke its alliance with the uh, the DVP. Um, and even though the DVP did support the two um, independent, no longer giving seats to the New Power Party to contest against the KMT. However, there were also opportunities. So, for example, in 2020, the DP had a much weaker social movement appeal compared to uh, 2016. Um, perhaps more challenging for the new power party in 2020 was the fact that um, there was much greater competition among small parties. Uh, the uh, Taiwan People's Party had been established by Taipei Mayor Kowenja. The state building party was also uh, making movement appeals. And of course, we also had the uh, Green Party running a well-funded uh, campaign. Um, but again, I think we need to look at the, uh, the New Power Party's own campaign to understand its ability to uh, increase its uh, vote share in 2020. I think there's a number of 
um, areas that can help explain uh, these developments. Well, firstly, I think the party was quite successful at building a party identity as distinct from the DUP. Uh, it also was building up an organizational base, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the 2018 local elections, where it, actually, where it did actually win a significant number of local seats. So it, became, it becomes more visible uh, on the ground. It also was quite successful at broadening its uh, sunflower kind of social movement image in terms of its nomination in 2020. I think a good example of this was the nomination of the senior environmentalist, uh, Chen Jiaohua. Um, again, it had a well-resourced campaign, both financially and, and in terms of human resources. Um, and this enabled it to do what often small parties struggle to do, and that is to uh, win re-election. Often small parties will win their first election and then fail to win re-election. Okay, next let me just talk briefly about the state building uh, party uh, case. What is quite interesting about this case is that it followed a similar strategy to the new power party in uh, 2016. In other words, it worked in alliance with uh, the DVP. Uh, the DVP gave it one seat to contest um, against the, uh, the case. However, this was also a very um, a difficult seat to win. So it needed to rely on a strong uh, state building party campaign. So it made heavy internet campaigning. It was also well resourced, well resourced and a very focused campaign. And it also benefited from uh, the salience of, for example, the Hong Kong protest um, issue. And also like the um, New Power Party, uh, it, it was able to broaden its uh, image. In the past, it had suffered from an image of being um, a largely male-dominated um, uh, party. So I think, for example, nominating the well-known uh, feminist scholar, uh, Chen Lingfang, I think, helped to broaden the party's image. And, um, and overall, it looked quite a successful campaign. I think many um, activists that had pr previously supported uh, the Green Party did switch over uh, to the State Building Party in 2020. Okay, now finally, um, what about the Green Party in uh, 2020? Well, let me start again with the party system uh, factors. Um, there were opportunities uh, posed by the less social movement uh, focused DVP. Um, nevertheless, the DVP also did create challenges for the Green Party in 2020. For example, it didn't offer the Green Party any seats, despite the fact that um, the Green Party was much more supportive of the DVP, particularly the pres presidential campaign. And the DVP even poached the um, uh, Social Democratic Party's uh, leader, Fan Yu. Um, we also see much stronger small party competition. Um, so the political market for small parties was much more competitive in 2020 than uh, in 2016. Um, in terms of movement appeals, we saw this from the State Building Party and the New Power Party. And as I mentioned, uh, looking at uh, many Green Party supporters, what I, what I found in 2020 was that many of them were um, defecting their support over to the State Building Party, New Power Party, or even the uh, DVP. Even the Taiwan People's Party um, seemed to pose a threat to the Green Party. So when the Taiwan People's Party was established, we saw a clear correlation in surveys of the uh, Green Party support initially going down, and only gradually did it recover as we approached the uh, election in January 2020. Um, but once again, I think the, um, the key variable we need to look at here is the actual quality of the campaign. Is the party able to balance vote maximizing and core party values? I think that there were some real positives in the Green Party's campaign in 2020. Um, I think in many ways, the nomination of the well-known psychiatrist, De Huiwen, was a real masterstroke for the party. Uh, it allowed it to bring in new supporters um, who had previously not supported the party. And the party also tries to appeal to 
traditional supporters through the nomination of its anti-nuclear party founder, uh, Gao Chengye. The party also had high media visibility as a result of the Taoyuan uh, councillor, Wang Haoyu. Um, and he was able to generate a lot of media coverage by negative campaigning against the KMT's presidential candidate, against um, the Taiwan People's Party and the New Power uh, Party. Um, the party also had quite a well-funded campaign, so we could see it spending on, on advertising, for example. Um, and it took a very different approach uh, to previous Green Party campaigns in terms of actually taking an open um, uh, position supporting uh, the DPP's presidential candidate. That hadn't happened in the, in the past. But I think once again, there were some serious weaknesses in the Green Party's campaign that can help us understand why it wasn't able to um, get over that critical 5%. Well, firstly, although the Green Party was able to bring in new supporters, it lost many of its traditional supporters from 2016. For example, labor unions, many LGBT um, activists, environmentalists, um, and even uh, one of its county councillors um, um, defected away from the, the party. It also wasn't able to maintain its alliance with the SDP, SDP from uh, 2016. Um, so this meant that it was running uh, on its own, unlike in, um, in 2016. Um, and it also suffered, suffered from some um, long-term um, strategy errors, particularly its loss of presence in Taipei. In other words, it had uh, stopped contesting elections, at least at the local level in Taipei, since uh, 2014. And I think that also uh, damaged the party's prospects in uh, 2020. Um, I think also the, the party really struggled to have a clear identity. And although um, um, county councillor or city councillor uh, Wang Haoyu, who we see pictured here, did bring in much media attention, he also alienated many traditional uh, Green Party supporters, particularly as a result of some of his criticism of um, social movements, particularly labor um, and uh, environmental uh, movements. So many were um, uncomfortable with a uh, well, how you dominated uh, Green Party. We also saw some of um, um, issues that have been quite familiar in uh, Green Party campaigns, such as starting the campaign too late, being much less visible on the ground compared to, let's say, the um, uh, new power uh, party. For example, it's, many of its party branches had effectively disappeared, um, with the exception of the Taoyuan and Xinjiang region. And, and lastly, I think as we saw in um, 2016, the party neglected the single member district, it just focused on uh, the party list. And, but this trend was even more apparent in 2020 than uh, 2016. Okay, so let me just um, uh, wrap up uh, briefly. So what I've tried to do in today's talk is to show how we can understand the, um, uh, the fate or the fortunes of movement parties uh, by using a framework that combines both um, party system approaches, but also party agency. So we can see how um, movement parties uh, despite operating in a very hostile electoral and party system with the right balancing, uh, they can actually both survive and thrive in the Taiwanese um, uh, political system. And I would argue that um, these kind of alternative parties play a really important role in enriching the quality of Taiwan's uh, democracy. I think for this reason, uh, I would argue that they actually do deserve uh, academic uh, attention. Okay, and I will finish my uh, talk there and hopefully um, I'll be able to um, uh, finish my Green Party's book. Thank you very much, uh, Davith, for those very interesting remarks. I'd like to start the question period um, with a question regarding the DPP. Is the DPP not a movement party, given its origins in the pro-democracy movement and the background of many of its senior leaders in the environmental movement and the labor rights movements as well? And at what point does a party stop being a movement party? 
I think that's a really interesting um, uh, question. I think um, at times we've seen tensions um, um, in the DVP on this issue. So for example, I think when the DVP first um, took uh, national power in 2000, uh, it was often using kind of uh, street protest or street rallies um, when it was actually the ruling um, uh, party. Um, but I think that we need to have a, some kind of rough cut, kind of cut-off point. Um, and I think um, I think we can take um, some point in the probably the early 1990s when the party is primarily um, a electoral oriented party, when it's really kind of starting to um, um, win significant number of parliamentary seats. Um, and gradually, I think what we see is um, um, the movement side of the party becomes secondary. Uh, of course, there is always um, uh, an interaction with uh, social movements. So I think um, uh, we do see that a lot of DVP figures um, first emerge from social movements. Um, and we see, for example, in the 1990s, the way the DVP does recruit from um, Wild Lily social student leaders, for example. Um, and, um, and more recently, they are trying to, they have been trying to recruit um, sunflower uh, figures. So, um, um, so I do take your, your, um, uh, your point there, but I think um, I would take the cutoff point as being at uh, some point in the early 1990s. And maybe some would even go um, uh, earlier, but there's always that, in, that really interesting relationship. And I think that um, we did see this um, accusation, for example, during the, uh, the Sunflower Movement, that uh, the Sunflowers were um, controlled by the DVP. But I think, um, I think anyone who's looked in detail on that topic will actually find that wasn't the case. Um, in other words, I think one of the things we see is that there's a lot of suspicion of uh, the DVP among many social movement activists. And that's one of the reasons why they've, they've actually um, been much more successful at making uh, movement parties viable or sustainable uh, over the last five, six years. Right, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tom Gold, your colleague, about how movement parties are funded. Um, and do they face the risk of deregistration at any point? Uh, how long do they stay on the register? And I wonder if I could tag on a, a minor addendum to that and ask if you could say something about the way the campaign finance system factors into the way movement parties um, are organized and the campaigns that they run. Yeah, I mean, it's a really great question. Um, um, I mean, when I think back to my, um, a lot of my field work with, um, uh, the uh, the Green Party. One of the things that's come up most often uh, has been lack of money, um, um, struggling to pay the candidate deposits, knowing that they're not going to get that money back, um, borrowing money that they know they can't um, uh, return, um, um, laying off staff uh, after elections. So that's been a perpetual. Uh, problem for um, many movement parties. But I think one of the things that's really quite interesting is that um, both the New Power Party and also more recently the State Building Party, and to a lesser extent the, the Green Party, have actually managed to improve their, uh, their fundraising um, mechanisms. Um, and that's the, one of the reasons why they've started to become um, uh, viable uh, challenges. Now, how do they get their the money? I think is a really um, um, uh, tricky question. Membership is is a relatively um, minor uh, factor. Um, at times, it's they've relied quite heavily on a, on a, a small number of uh, generous uh, donors. Often, they've relied on things like uh, academics um, and, to a lesser extent, business people. But it's been a perpetual. Um, uh, struggle. And that's one of the reasons why I think state funding is very important. Um, so um, if parties can get over, in the current um, political parties law, they need to get over, I think, 3% to earn state funding. So that meant that 
uh, the state building party's ability to just get over that level, even though it didn't win the party of the seat, was really, um, uh, really critical. Um, now there was a question about registration. Right. Um, traditionally, it's been very, very easy for a party to register in Taiwan. Um, and that is one of the reasons why, if you look at the Ministry of Interior's parties list, it's very, very long. And many of these parties you'll never have heard of. Um, however, in, um, uh, recently there have been some, some adjustments to the um, um, regulations for political parties. Um, and this has resulted in um, a pretty significant number of basically political parties on paper that don't really um, uh, operate um, being wound up. Um, but the process has been very, very slow. Let me just give you one example. Um, that is the, uh, the Chinese Social Democratic Party, which nominated quite extensively in 1991 and 1992, and then basically disappeared. Uh, some of its members joined, merged with the, um, uh, the new party. But basically the party stopped functioning, um, what is that, 28 years ago. But the party was only wound up um, this year. So that, that kind of tells you uh, uh, something. And I think that um, 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 we will see a reduction in the number of political parties, uh, or at least uh, parties that aren't operating um, anymore. Thank you. Um, Karis Templeman has a question. Um, he notes that the DPP successfully grew out of its movement party roots and became a sort of catch-all major party. Um, he wonders what does the NPP or any other movement party need to do in order to achieve something similar and to stick around for the long run in the party system? Are there lessons to be drawn from the DPP's experience about making that transition? Yes, I think that's a, again a, a kind of a fascinating question. I can remember uh, back in um, uh, 2016, uh, there was quite a lot of talk, um, uh, optimistic talk in, in, uh, among some of my friends in the DUP that uh, the new power party was going to replace the, uh, the KMT as the second largest um, uh, political party. Uh, but when we come to the, uh, the first round of elections um, after 2016 in 2018, uh, the new power party did win, for maybe it was 15 or 16 uh, local seats, which was significant for a movement party, but in the big picture, um, it's it's tiny compared to the um, uh, two or 300 seats that the mainstream parties were winning. And it's also uh, far less than the splinter parties were winning at the local level at their peak um, in 2000 and, um, 2002. So um, I think the new power party is doing many of the things that it should be doing. In other words, it's building up organizational bases. That's important. Having real party branches, uh, having national media visibility, um, gaining autonomy from the DP. It was a risky um, strategy to take, but I think it's a strategy that, that small parties have to do. Because I think one of the things that we've found time and again with small parties is that if they're too close to the mainstream parties, the mainstream parties can basically um, make limited concessions, uh, ideological concessions, and win back those supporters. So small parties need to develop their own distinct identities. And I think that's something that many of those splinter parties failed to do. And that's part of the reason why uh, they um, uh, collapsed. So I think there's a range of strategies that um, uh, small parties need to take. I think, of course, we can come back to funding. I think funding, um, both financial and human resources are really critical. If, um, um, sometimes even human resources are more important than, than financial resources because they often come, um, come together. But I think the New Power Party, its ability to survive um, a lot of challenges in its first couple of years, I think is, is quite, um, uh, impressive. 
Thank you. We have a question from a journalist who notes that um, at the two sessions meetings uh, in Beijing, um, Li Keqiang uh, removed the word peaceful from the PRC's policy of reunification from, with Taiwan. Uh, and the questioner wonders uh, if any Taiwan, if any of Taiwan's movement parties are, uh, are addressing the issue of independence and the relationship with the PRC. That's a fantastic question. And I think one of the reasons that is an interesting question is that traditionally the uh, small parties in Taiwan have been split to parties. Um, and they've, um, their identity has been linked uh, to um, the unification versus independence um, uh, issue. Um, in other words, um, they are really focusing on um, the more radical wings of the, um, uh, the political spectrum in, uh, in Taiwan. Um, now, what about the movement parties? To a large extent, um, they've, um, their identity has been alternative. So they've tried not to stress uh, relations with China. They've tried to stress um, uh, social uh, issues. So they've often suffered when the agenda has been dominated by relations with China. And I think we saw that in 2016 when we had the, uh, the Zhou Ziyu um, um, incident where a, uh, a Taiwanese K-pop star was forced to uh, make a public apology uh, for using the waving the ROC um, uh, flag. Now, I think, um, I think one of the reasons why um, the New Power Party and the State Building Party have managed to be relevant is they've managed to uh, have a, a kind of a hybrid appeal. Uh, in other words, they've included both um, um, social issues, but also uh, they've been able to handle the China issue quite effectively. Uh, so, for example, the New Power Party protested against the um, um, meeting between Ma Ying jeou and Xi Jinping in uh, 2015. And I think the State Building Party is probably uh, more like at times, it feels more like a, um, um, a splinter party at times, um, a, with a lot of uh, Taiwan independence um, uh, rhetoric. Um, the party that I focused on, the Green Party, has, has, has also really has struggled with this issue, even though it has quite a clear-cut pro-independence uh, position. It's just not seen as being a, an independence um, party. So I think it's a, uh, it's a challenge. And um, I think one of the lessons we see from recent elections is that small parties need to be uh, convincing on this issue. And they can't just rely on um, um, social issues. We have a question from Kara Stempelman regarding the role that personality still plays in Taiwanese politics. Um, he notes that the Taiwan People's Party did very well in the 2020 election without much of a platform at all. And he asks, is it a movement party since Ko Wenjie was originally backed by many of the Sunflower Movement activists, or is it more of a personality-driven enterprise? Uh, and does ideology or uh, does personality matter more than ideology or programmatic positions um, in a case like this, uh, for particularly for Taiwan voters who don't like the two major parties? Uh, are there still vehicles for personalities in, in the system? Yeah, I think that's, again, it's a great, great question because we have had um, parties that did rely quite heavily on personalities. Let's say the, um, uh, the People First Party uh, and also the Taiwan Solidarity Union relying on Li Zhong Hui. Um, but they also had their uh, identity um, appeals uh, as part of the, uh, the package. So I think the emergence of this Taiwan People's Party is really uh, one of the most interesting elements of um, uh, 2020. Where do we fit it? Um, and I think you're right that initially, um, um, Ko and Joe rode on that kind of sunflower uh, wave in, um, in 2014. Um, but um, his kind of party identity has become much more blurred. Um, and I think that he has managed to appeal to um, a lot of voters who, who, as, who, as you say, just don't like the mainstream parties um, and are not really interested in um, the kind of identity appeals. Um, 
how viable this um, project is going to be is, I think, is another matter. I'm not really too sure. Um, polls seem to be suggesting that um, the support for the Taiwan People's Party has been in decline since uh, the elections in, uh, in January. So it's going to be really interesting. Um, but I think um, you're right, the personalities matter. I think that um, this has been one of the long-term problems with uh, many of the movement parties in that they've neglected the importance of stars. Um, and I think that's um, something that the new power party uh, was successful at. In other words, it had some semi-stars um, and that made it quite different from the traditional um, um, uh, movement parties. So at the moment, um, thinking about classifications, I guess I would probably put the Taiwan People's Party as a kind of personality vehicle. Um, I think some people have talked about it being a, a populist party. And I think that's also something um, that I think is, is, is debatable as well. I wonder if I could pose a, a follow-up question to that and, and ask if you could say something sociologically about the type of voter who joins movement parties in Taiwan, either as, uh, or either as a candidate or an activist or, or uh, a participant, and how they differ from people who join mainstream parties in their preferences, backgrounds, political skills and resources, their motives. Um, yeah, that's a great question. It's something that's come up quite a lot um, in, uh, in my research on the um, on the Green Party. Um, well, I think there's a couple of key things we can see. Um, firstly, movement party supporters tend to be much younger. Uh, they tend to be um, um, in their 20s. Um, uh, they tend to be urban-based, um, so they really struggled uh, in the more agricultural um, uh, districts. Um, and I think like movement party supporters internationally, uh, they tend to have um, some kind of experience um, with social movements. Um, um, looking at both activists and candidates, a large number of them have been involved in environmental campaigns, um, campaigns for LGBT rights, um, labor movements, um, so I think that's uh, another um, um, uh, key feature. They tend to be quite well educated. Um, so, um, so you could get a sense of what kind of people they, the parties have tended to target. Um, I think they've really struggled with um, uh, older voters. Um, that's really been a, a, a kind of a, um, uh, a key uh, weakness for uh, movement parties. So their, uh, their support base has been quite different from those of many of the splinter parties, like the New Party, People First Party, or the Taiwan Solidarity Union, which in contrast tends to rely much more heavily on older voters. Right. Um, I have a question coming in from Larry, uh, Larry Diamond, who asks uh, or who notes that, that Taiwan does not seem to have movement parties on the right of the spectrum. Uh, and like Japan, Taiwan has an aging population and there are powerful demographic and economic arguments for admitting migrants. Um, what do you think the effects of more immigration would be on the movement party phenomenon in Taiwan, especially if migrants are people who do not identify as Han? And how do you explain the absence of right-wing movement parties? Yes, um, this, is, this is really interesting. I think raising the, uh, the migration um, uh, issue because I think one of the things we've seen in recent years has been a very significant increase in marriage migration. Um, and uh, there's two major um, groups from both from China and also from Southeast Asia, particularly uh, from uh, Vietnam. And, and as this process has been going on over, uh, over two decades, um, uh, many of these migrant spouses have gained Taiwanese citizenship. Uh, their children are increasingly old enough to actually uh, have uh, voting rights. So where are these votes going to uh, go? I think that's, that's maybe a first thing to think about. Um, and what, I think what we've seen is the parties have gradually uh, understood the importance of these new constituencies. Um, and 
I think one of the things, for example, we saw in 2016 was that the DUP had Vietnamese election ads to try and appeal to these new um, uh, voters. Um, we haven't really yet seen what I would call um, relevant um, um, either far right parties. Um, and I think that's partly due to the type of migration we're seeing in Taiwan. Um, in other words, we're seeing um, it's very, very gendered. I think something like 90% of these new citizens um, are female uh, and they're marrying Taiwanese uh, males. So they've been in a way integrated within um, uh, Taiwanese um, uh, society. Um, in some cases, um, particularly for Chinese spouses, um, uh, political parties have been established to um, push their interests, but they haven't yet become uh, electorally uh, viable. But they have worked quite closely with the KMT. Um, also, pro-unification parties have tried to win their votes. So, for example, in 2016, um, a Chinese, um, a former Chinese citizen was nominated by the China Unification Promotion uh, Party or party uh, list. So, uh, but thus far, I think Taiwan's political parties have been much more inclusive of spouses from Southeast Asia than from uh, China. Uh, so there has been a, a um, slightly different uh, approaches there, even for the um, uh, for the KMT. A further question. In some parliamentary systems, smaller parties play outsized roles because they can tip the balance and form coalition governments. Uh, their leaders then are often rewarded with very high profile assignments in government uh, and high profile government posts. For example, Israel, Germany for many years and very briefly in the UK under Cameron. Uh, what are the prospects of movement parties stabilizing in Taiwan evolving some form of institutionalized coalition government? Yes, that's a, a um, another really interesting uh, question. I, I, I guess that the um, small parties had their biggest kind of potential for blackmailing mainstream parties when there was a hung parliament um, in the DUP era of 2000 to 2008. And there the, their role um, was, I think, pretty significant. Um, nowadays, I don't really see that because we have um, the uh, Taiwan has and the DV have had majorities for these two terms. Um, so I think their role is much more in terms of changing the political agenda, um, raising issues that the mainstream parties are neglecting. Um, will we see kind of coalition governments? Um, I think in Taiwan's um, uh, current uh, political system, it's unlikely in the short term, partly because um, uh, legislators can't serve in cabinet. So you have that kind of uh, divide. I think that's one of the, uh, the reasons. So potentially, I think one of the things that you can see is that um, figures from movement parties may actually go into government, but not as party representatives. I think that's something we have seen. So for example, if we look at uh, Taiwan's first um, term, uh, she did bring in um, a number of Green Party uh, figures into her cabinet. I think there was a deputy environmental minister um, into the, the uh, first um, uh, cabinet who had stood for the, uh, the Green Party. So I think we do see that kind of influence uh, there. Um, but it's not a, um, uh, it's definitely not at the coalition government stage uh, yet. I think we probably need to wait until the next time Taiwan has a hung parliament. We may see this at the, at the local level. So for example, we do often see, um, um, for example, in the Taoyuan city government, we have seen uh, cooperation in the past between a Green Party uh, city councillor and the DBP uh, government. So they were working in, um, in cooperation there. But again, it's not exactly a, a coalition uh, cabinet. So I guess, I think that's something for the future. Right. Right. Well, related to that is a normative question, and that is, is the presence of movement parties in the, in the legislative UN a good or bad thing for Taiwan's democracy? What if they fail to win seats, for example, but get the major parties, um, usually the DPP historically, to adopt many of their positions? Um, 
what is to be gained by having them win seats if the mainstream parties are sufficiently responsive to their chief concerns? For example, safe-sex marriage, nuclear power, labor reforms, women's rights. Um, uh, what role do they play then uh, in the system? Well, I, um, I think the fact that the mainstream parties have to respond to movement parties, I think, um, would be, I, I would take that as a measure of success. Um, um, I think they put pressure on the, um, uh, the DUP to actually not neglect uh, these, um, uh, these issues. Um, and I think that pressure is going to be stronger if the movement parties are in parliament than if they're just outside. If they're uh, in the current situation, they can put pressure on the, uh, the government, both in parliament and outside parliament. Um, if it's just outside parliament, then I can, uh, we can think about uh, the patterns we saw in the Church Rebian era and also in the Mindjo era, when they were much easier to ignore when they were just outside um, uh, parliament or just taken, just playing consulting uh, roles, as we saw in the, uh, the DVP um, era. So overall, my sense is that they've actually brought something um, quite different and I think brought much more diversity um, into the, the, um, the party system than we had in the, in the past. And I see that as a real positive. And, and that's one of the reasons why um, um, I would argue that uh, Taiwan should be trying to increase that uh, diversity, um, both in the national parliament, for example, by reducing the threshold. Uh, currently, the threshold for seats is still 5%, which is a very high uh, hurdle for small parties to uh, pass. Uh, but one of the things I have argued in, in a couple of publications is that um, um, the, this should also be brought into the local level. So at the moment, if, at the local level, Taiwan still has a um, single non-transferable vote with multi-member district electoral system at the local level. Um, and I think movement parties find it very hard to actually make breakthroughs in this, in this kind of electoral system. So one of the things that um, I have proposed, and I think the Green Party has also proposed, has been bringing in uh, an element of proportional representation into local um, uh, elections. And I think this would um, uh, have a similar impact um, on the way that local politics uh, operates. So, um, um, and I know that um, uh, Tsai Ing-wen is a, um, um, has sometimes come to, to uh, Stanford, if, she, if she's watching, that is one of the things I would strongly encourage the DUP to do, just to, to bring in uh, proportional representation into the local um, uh, government, or local elections as part of its constitutional reform package. I wonder if you could take that a little further and we'll close with a final question from Larry Diamond, who asks what the effect of having two ballots is, one for single member uh, districts and one for the proportional representation list, and whether that makes it easier to vote for small parties structurally and has been advantageous for them. Um, yes, I think uh, initially, I think when the, this uh, two vote system was first introduced in 2008, I think a lot of voters didn't really understand uh, what it meant. And, and we saw a, a collapse of small parties um, in that initial election. But I think voters have gradually got used to this idea of split ticket voting. Um, in other words, voting for the mainstream parties for the presidential and in most of the districts. But having that option of um, voting with the heart um, on the party list. Um, I think that's, I think it's a pretty good thing uh, that it means that even if you're in a safe seat, a safe district, um, you know you're go your party's going to lose, um, but you know that your party list vote will count for something. Um, again, I think that is um, uh, really important. I know, for example, in the UK, I'm very envious of um, uh, Taiwan's voters of having these, um, uh, these options. Um, I've always lived in safe conservative districts. Uh, and I've, my vote in the uh, UK Parliament has always been a wasted vote. Uh, and I think, um, I, I'm pretty sure US voters would quite enjoy uh, having those two votes. Uh, so that even, for example, if you're in a very strong uh, Republican uh, district, uh, that second vote would actually have some kind of a, uh, an impact. I think it would definitely be quite 
um, encouraging and um, for voters, and maybe it would actually increase uh, turnout uh, rates. So I think it's um, I think as voters have gradually got used to this system in Taiwan, I think they've really come to appreciate uh, it. Um, and um, I mean, of course, we do have the issue of having sometimes having too many choices in the Taiwanese elections. Uh, in 2016, I think there were 18 choices on the ballot. Um, and in 2020, there were 19. And many of these are quite meaningless, empty parties. Um, but I think voters see through that. And I think if you look at the voting rates, um, most of those empty parties only got a very um, uh, tiny number of um, votes. Um, and also, the, um, uh, we can also see how some of the more extreme parties also did very badly. Um, um, under this, this system. So it, it suggested that, uh, of course, one of the thing, reasons why um, in the UK we've been quite cautious about proportional representation has been the fear of extremist parties. Uh, but overall, my sense is that Taiwanese voters are actually quite rational and sophisticated and have been quite good at punishing uh, extremist parties. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fascinating discussion and a, and a very rich presentation. Um, I would like to invite all of our attendees to join our next event in the, in the Hoover Project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region, which will be held on June 11th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, it is entitled First In, First Out, The Economic Impact of COVID-19 on Asian Economies, and will be given by Mr. Bert Hoffman, who is the World Bank Country Director for China from 2014 to 2019, and the Chief Economist for the World Bank in East Asia and Pacific from 2011 to 2014. On behalf of the Hoover Institution and its project on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific region, I thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.